Welcome everyone to our first 2019 webcast. It is our first webcast on Zoom and we're very pleased that our very first webcast could be about our award winners. Uh, so we will, uh, I'm gonna move this, this slide forward. Uh, this webcast is about our sensational award winners part two. We had part one in December, if you recall, actually it was the end of November, um, with our professional licensure disclosure award winners. This is our location winners and our compliance innovation winners. And they're going to be speaking to you today about the work that they did and uh, their uh, award-winning work so that we can uh, better understand the implementation of processes they have put in place at their institution. Uh, something I'd like to share with you is that there is a question box. Please look for the Q&A section. That is where we'll be putting in the questions uh, in this tool. Um, so you can look to put the questions in there. Um, we will archive the PowerPoint and the recording on the SAN website. You will find that under resources, past webinars. And uh, different in this tool, it says PowerPoints can be downloaded in the handouts pane. We are not able to do that. We don't have that access here, but you can find that on the current events. Um, it, was, it was loaded yesterday um, in case you needed to have it while we are going through this presentation. However, I can tell you that the PowerPoint will be archived along with the URL to hear the recording um, shortly after this, uh, after this webcast, probably by the end of the week. We will be taking questions from the audience. We'll wait for those questions until the end of the presentations to make sure that all of our presenters have the opportunity to share their information. The uh, Q&A box, as I was mentioning, is where you'll place your questions. We will ask the questions of the presenters. It might even be helpful, actually, if you could identify to whom that you wish your question to be asked, if it is to a particular presenter, since we have uh, multiple presenters today about different um, award-winning processes. And uh, those questions that we're not able to get to by the end of the hour are banked. And so we will be working with our presenters to get answers to your questions and post those answers along with the archived webcast um, on the SAN website. So your questions will be answered even if they're not um, answered today at the end of the webcast. I'm Cheryl Dowd. I'm the director for the State Authorization Network with WCET. I'm the moderator for today, as well as Dan Silverman, who's our assistant director for the State Authorization Network. He's with us today. Hello, Dan. Greetings. And so we'll move right into our awards. Very pleased to introduce you to our, our, our two award winners, um, University of Louisville and uh, Mount St. Mary's University for the award for location. Let me just tell you a little bit about our award winners. First, Catherine Cross from the University of Louisville. She is the Distance Education Compliance Manager at the University of Louisville. And her role, she is responsible for making sure the university complies with federal and state laws and regulations relating to distance education. She earned her Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and her Juris Doctorate from the University of Louisville. She is a licensed attorney in Kentucky and has worked on state authorization since 2014. Catherine served as the Kentucky State Authorization Work, serves on the Kentucky uh, State Authorization Work Group, a group formed to help institutions navigate the complex laws and regulations. She assisted University of Louisville in earning the 2015 and 2018 WCET Sensational Awards for determining student locations. We're very pleased to have uh, Catherine with us. And I'm gonna introduce our Mount St. Mary's um, folks as well before we move on to Catherine's presentation. But first, with Mount St. Mary's University, we have Kyris Grimes. She began her state authorization journey as a graduate assistant in 2015 and began working as the Office of the Provost Coordinator in 2016 after obtaining her master's degree in higher education administration. Her compliance responsibilities include staying up to date on changes in state and federal regulations that may affect um, the institution, communicating communicating with state regulators and keeping record of their status with each state. Additionally, she is responsible for applying for and maintaining authorization across the states and being a resource for chairs, directors, and other managers regarding compliance. She's taken advantage of personal growth opportunities provided by WCET SAN, such as the 2016 Advanced Topics Workshop, and was recently able to present 
represent Mount St. Mary's University at the 2018 NASAPS meeting in Portland. She's looking forward to future growth and development opportunities to sharpen her knowledge and skills in the field. You may notice that she was talking about being able to maintain uh, what is required in each state. She, their institution is located in California. Michelle Starkey is our other presenter for Mount St. Mary's University. She is the Associate Provost and, and Accreditation Liaison Officer at Mount St. Mary's University in Los Angeles. She's a graduate of the Mount and she began working at the university in 1997. Prior to her current position, she served as Assistant Provost and before that as Co-Chair of the Department of the Physical Sciences and Mathematics. She earned her Doctorate in Educational Leadership and her Master's in Mathematics, both from California State University, Long Beach has been teaching college level mathematics for over 15 years. She began working in the area of state authorization and compliance in 2014. Her interests include quantitative literacy, math anxiety, and assessment of student learning outcomes. In her current position, Dr. Starkey has led campus assessment, faculty development, and the Mount St. Mary University online program. Michelle is the author or co-author of numerous academic papers with a special emphasis on mathematic education instruction techniques, assessment, and achievement. We're very pleased to have both of our presenters from Mount St. Mary University. But going back for our first presenter in this award, congratulations to the University of Louisville and to Catherine Cross. And we'll start with Catherine Cross. Catherine, welcome today. Okay, we will make sure that she is unmuted. There you go, Catherine, is that better? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to present here today, and I hope the information I go through is useful to the SAN membership. Um, to start, I thought I'd do what a lot of other presenters have done before and give a little bit of context about the University of Louisville more broadly. U of L is a large state-supported research institution in Louisville, Kentucky. We have around 22,500 total students throughout our undergraduate, graduate, and professional schools. A little, under, a little under 1,700 of those are enrolled in online programs. As of now, we have 33 online programs across multiple disciplines with more scheduled to launch over the next few years. Next slide, please. So the bulk of my presentation will be on the details of our location identification processes, but I thought I'd give a little bit of context about online learning at UofL because it will feed into a discussion of our processes. Next slide, please. U of L is a decentralized institution, but most of the responsibility relating to distance education is within the Delphi Center where I work. So at its inception, the Delphi Center for Teaching and Learning had much responsibility for growing online learning at U of L. The Delphi Center assists programs with developing and launching new online programs, including guiding the program through the approval process, marketing and recruiting, enrollment services, and compliance, obviously. So when the 2010 federal state authorization regulations were announced, the Delphi Center was tasked with state authorization. Throughout the years, that responsibility has evolved from obtaining approval to offer online programs to ensuring compliance with state and federal laws relating to distance education more generally. In that time, the Delphi Center's collaborated and developed close partnerships with other university departments, such as institutional research, university council, and of course the academic units. Those partnerships help us to evolve and improve the thoroughness and efficiency of our processes. I'll mention some of those partnerships in going through our processes. Next slide, please. So as a big picture overview of our process, U of L has identified three points in an individual's time with us where we believe it's critical to know where he or she is located. Pre-enrollment, so that's the time of inquiry or application. Enrollment in an online program or enrollment in a field placement course, which we also call experiential learning. We are able to know the volume of educational activity outside the state and take the action needed to ensure compliance with weekly, monthly, and semester based reports. We also have regular communication with our partner programs and other university departments. We utilize different technologies to identify where our students are located, and I'll describe those as I go through each step. Next slide, please. We use prospective student address information, which is housed in our CRM system radius, to gauge interest from non-Kentucky states. We obtain this information when a student submits an inquiry form or when they speak with an enrollment counselor. The enrollment management team can manually enter this information if it doesn't automatically come through via the form. Radius provides a means by which our online learning team can determine what program students are inquiring about 
where they're located, and whether or not they apply and enroll in a program. I personally receive daily and weekly reports and a monthly summary through an automated established process. We created a variety of reports to review where students are located, interested students are located, I should say. The two reports I most rely upon in this area are the inquiry report and the applicant report. Based on the frequency of inquiries and applicants, we decided on a daily review of inquiries and a weekly review of applicants. Reviewing inquiries on a daily basis allows me to immediately notice whether students are inquiring from, from states where the program is not available and I can notify the enrollment management team. Since applications are less frequent, my weekly review ensures that applicants into programs from restricted states are contacted quickly and the situation resolved as necessary. The enrollment management team utilizes RADIUS throughout the day so they can notice any issues as they come in to RADIUS. We think the requirement on the student is simple and practical as they are only prompted to provide the information you see on our inquiry form. We find this information critical as it, as it enables us to provide state-specific information to students, such as our authorization status or professional licensure information. RADIUS also allows us to automate the ways in which we disseminate the information and to review all communications with students. This, we believe this process to be practical and thorough as well because it ensures that every student receives the information they need before they enroll. So in the event that a student does not inquire through our office, which they are not required to do, and they apply without inquiring, the applicant reports will cover those individuals and we'll be able to give them the information they need. Next slide, please. So for current students, U of L maintains current student locations in PeopleSoft. Students are required to update the address that they uh, will be receiving their education in PeopleSoft before every semester. The first time they log in to add courses every fall, spring, and summer, they will see the image that you see on the slide here. They will be asked, in case you can't read it, it says, please provide the address that best describes the anticipated physical location of the place you will be living during the semester that you're registering for. This updates a specific address within PeopleSoft called the local address and students cannot register for courses until they answer this question. At the start of each term, Institutional Research, or IR as we say, will send a report to us listing all students enrolled in an online plan code with a local address outside of Kentucky. And under this process, if we find a student enrolled from in an unauthorized state or program, we will contact the department first to determine the status of the student, and if necessary, we attempt to resolve the issue with the student, student state higher education agency. But of course, we hope that our previous processes for prospective students would have prevented that from happening in the first place. Now that we have joined Sarah, we've added another report to ensure accurate annual reporting. So IR created a visual analytics report that provides a breakdown of online enrollment by state and country. It's the, it's the field that we report to IPED. Once I receive this report, I analyze the data, and if there seems to be any inconsistency, they'll email the program with any potential issues. After that data is reported, if there were any issues, I would work with NC Sarah to resolve it. Uh, we think this is a nice review because it has just another check on the data that we have before. Next slide, please. For years now, we've been tracking out-of-state field placements by collecting enrollment data on courses that have long before been designated as containing a field placement or experiential learning component. Experiential learning is the term that we use to broadly encompass activities such as practicum, clinical, internship, student teaching, and all the like. The process was initially developed to help us determine where students were going so that we could obtain required approvals, but there was a bit of a limitation because the way the system worked only allowed us to determine where students were going for field placement, and we couldn't tell how many students were in such states. So I would have to inquire with the programs on an as-needed basis to find that specific information. So with that little bit of gap, we collaborated with IR and the registrar's office to see what could be done to get the data on a student level information. So we drafted what we call the Experiential Learning Tracking Project. And the purpose of the project was to formalize a process to collect and report the data in all states so that we maintain compliance in SARA, ensure all placements are appropriately authorized at the student level, and verify that the student may count the placement toward any professional or licensure requirements. We require all online and campus-based programs to report this data. Uh, our relationship with institutional research allows us to present this data in this process to the university leadership on an as-needed basis, 
or any changes or issues. So the process will start with the registrar's office producing a report of courses that have been, course enrollments that have been formally designated as containing the experiential learning component. The registrar's office will send that report of students to the associate deans at an established point in the semester. The deans will then be responsible for ensuring that for each individual enrollment, that PeopleSoft indicates what state such placements took place by the established deadlines. And once that information is updated in PeopleSoft, the registrar's office will send me a report of the course enrollment, including the state data. What I will then do is analyze and report the data. If necessary, I'll reach out to programs if there's any questions or issues. So for example, if any program appears to have more than 10 students enrolled in field placements, under Sarah, that maybe could be a trigger for authorization. So I would email the programs to determine the individual sites that the placements are taking place so I can determine if authorization is necessary. I also prepare the data to be reported to any agencies, including NC Sarah, and would work with those agencies if there were any issues with the data. We believe this process is not burdensome on students or faculty and staff. For students, the only requirement would be to follow their supervisor's instructions to locate a suitable field placement and have it approved. Uh, after the students have located and submitted these for approval, it's up to the faculty member to approve the site and add the information to PeopleSoft. So students are not required to take any additional steps than they were already required to do so. For faculty, this process only adds one extra step in what they already do in order to approve and facilitate these courses. And using PeopleSoft to house the, institution, the institutional data allows staff to easily generate the reports needed to review it for compliance purposes. Next slide, please. So here you can see an example of what the report that I receive looks like. Uh, this is a report that I would receive after they have updated the state information in PeopleSoft. It includes the course name, number, student information, the component type, and the state, if not Kentucky. And again, the component type is what we use to generate the report. It's what is used to identify courses that have the field placement component. Um, to simplify this process for faculty, we ask that they only update the state field if the placement is outside of Kentucky. We thought it might ease a little bit of burden on there. So when you see the blank on this table, when I see that in my report, I know that that means the placement took place in Kentucky. Next slide, please. Uh, here is my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. I'd be happy to discuss in more detail. It was, this was a, a long and evolving process and I feel like we're always learning more as we go. So it's always great to talk to other people and learn and grow from there. So thank you everyone for listening. Thank you very much, Catherine. It, it is really, um, you mentioned, you know, being able to talk with others about the kind of processes that you went through to, to, to come up with this plan. And uh, that's what our network is about. And so I really do appreciate that you're willing to share uh, with our, our members uh, so that they can know what kind of processes that you've been working with at your institution. And so that, thank you so much for this. And uh, we are going to move on to our other award winner for location, Mount St. Mary's University. And as I mentioned before, we have Kiris Grimes and Michelle Starkey. So I'm gonna move right ahead to Mount St. Mary's University. Michelle, are you able to come on? Yeah, Carice is supposed to start though. I know, I'm trying to unmute her. Um, yes, okay. Having difficulty with that. Okay. Is okay, Carice, yes. can you Got come it? in? Okay. okay. I started the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I appreciate um, your patience. As I said, this is a slightly different tool and uh, it's working a little bit differently. So um, thank you for no your problem. patience and glad we figured that out. No problem, yes. Um, okay, so uh, thanks, Cheryl. Um, we are so excited to, and just happy to be able to present this information to you all. Uh, so Mount St. Mary's University, we are a Catholic liberal arts institution, primarily for women. Um, we have two campuses, and they're both located in Los Angeles, California. Uh, we have about 3,000 students total, about 80 to 100 of those students are fully online. Um, however, most or 
many of our um, on-ground students take advantage of our of our online programs um, or online courses. So much of the information that we're going to be presenting today both apply to our on-ground and online students. Um, next slide, please. So for our agenda, we'll be discussing our policy, um, our process of how we determine where our students are, which is actually really similar to um, University of Louisville, and how we monitor our process to avoid students partaking in activities in states where we're not allowed to conduct out-of-state activities in. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so this is our physical location policy, and this also doubles as our disclosure. This policy was developed by the provost office in consultation with the fully online programs, our compliance team, and our state authorization consultant. And you'll see that we've um, made it look like the Bible a little bit um, in order to draw your attention to a few areas. That first, uh, first being in that first paragraph, we state what our limitations are, and we also note the importance of the student's physical location. Um, and in that second paragraph, we include other activities that the policy applies to as well. And then we also clearly state what the student is actually required to do if they choose to change their physical location. In that final paragraph, we disclose that we may or may not be able to allow students to continue taking online courses or approve their clinical or internship placement, and that all depends on where they're physically, physically located, um, partaking in these activities. Next slide, please. So this first portion, who this policy applies to, is actually included in the policy itself, and we decided to include it just to, so that we're clear to students um, that this information not, doesn't only apply to uh, online programs and courses. And so in determining where we wanted to or where we needed to, to put these, um, to put the information where to place the policy. We try to think of where prospective students, applicants, and our current students will actually go and come in contact with this information um, and where they would, would find it if they were, if they were to seek, uh, seek for it or seek it. And so below we've listed all of the places where we've, um, where we've put the policy in. And so to give you a little insight on our thought process, for example, um, in our website where we've where we place the this policy on our website is actually for um, or where fully online students would would normally go um, and and find this information and so to kind of balance that we also placed it in our catalog because we know that all students have access to the catalog and um, our online catalog is where uh, on-ground students would more than likely go and find this information. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we included a few areas where, or a few locations where um, it's almost more of a guarantee that students will come across this information. And so in our application, for example, um, our application for fully online programs in particular, we embedded a question or built in a question that asked students where they're going to be physically located while taking their online courses. If they were to select a, a state where we're not, we're not allowed to offer um, online, um, we're not allowed to, to offer our, any of our online courses or programs in, then a pop-up will appear that has this information um, stated and they would actually physically have to check a box that um, and approve or a, agree to move on with the application, or they can just close out of the application completely. Um, and it's a similar situation with our registration system where uh, it's almost, it's pretty much guaranteed that the students would be exposed to this information or to this policy, and Michelle will discuss that a little further. Um, next slide, please. So here we've just included a screenshot to show 
um, where this policy is located on our um, online catalog, and we've also included a link there that will take you directly to that um, location if you'd like to, to view it for yourself a little later. And I'll hand this over to you, Michelle. All right, thank you, Carrie. Next slide, Cheryl. Thank you. Um, actually, before I start, I would like to say that we actually got the idea for how to um, track our students through a webinar similar to this. Um, another sensational award winner, Sherry Miller at Northern Arizona. So um, thank you, Sherry, for um, giving us the idea. And hopefully some of you will also be able to get ideas from us in Louisville and do something similar. So I'll be talking about the process we developed to ensure that our community understands the importance of knowing where our students are physically located, especially since, like Cheryl mentioned, we are in California, so we are not a SARA state, so we are not part of SARA, so we have to get authorized or um, approved in every single state if we want, and so we have a list of maybe 33 states that we are allowed to do activities in and others that we are not. Um, so we want to create something where all students would be required to let us know where they will be physically located each semester. At first, we played with just asking students who were registering for online courses and asking them, but then we realized there are other courses that are not so easily identified where a student may be outside of California to do it, like a, an internship or something like that. So we decided to ask every single student every time they register for courses, which is twice a year. And so our students register online and they put their courses into their cart. But prior to them being able to hit the register button, the system requires them to update their physical location. It actually, in the background, the system checks if the location has been updated within the last six months. And if not, it takes them to the physical location screen, which I'll show you in a minute, um, and forces them to update it. Um, in addition, there are programs that allow, there are on-ground programs even, that allow their students to conduct field experiences outside of California. And so they frequently remind their students about the policy for requesting such a location and that they may or may not be able to go to the one that they request. Um, some uh, programs have restrictions. Um, ex for example, our doctorate in physical therapy, they require students to make special requests at least a year in advance because they not only need to have us research the state authorization piece, but they have to look into the professional licensing in that state, as well as the site itself. They have to have a contract with them and they have to you know, ensure compliance in all these areas. And other programs actually tell their students they can't go out of California. And so they know that that's not allowed in that particular program. So that's up to the individual programs to communicate that with their students. Um, but then we also work, Carissa and I work closely with all of the chairs and program directors regularly telling them, um, we give them a monthly report basically to let them know which states we are allowed to have students conduct activities in and we um, identify any changes that have happened in the past month. You know, we might indicate there's a state, you know, that we're going to not renew and so in three months we're not going to be allowed to do that anymore or we're in the process of applying to this state so pretty soon hopefully we'll be able to go there, you know, so we keep them up to date on any changes that are happening. Next screen, please. So here is a screenshot of our physical location screen. We use a Lucian's colleague, <clears throat> excuse me, as our student information system. And so students access registration in this screen through WebAdvisor, although we'll be switching over to something called self-service soon, which is also through a Lucian colleague. Um, the form is simple to easy to complete here, right? It just takes a few seconds to fill out. Um, under the state dropdown, they can, they can select foreign location and then, um, or foreign country, and if they do that, then there's another dropdown where they can select the actual country that they'll be going to. Um, and students can even save time on the registration day. I don't know about you, but at our campus, some students, you know, are on it, you know, before midnight and they're ready to go and just want to hit register right away so they can get the classes they want. So students are told that they um, need to complete this physical location screen every six months. And so they can go in earlier and fill this out so that it doesn't slow them down on registration day. And so you can see there that we have a shortened version of our policy there. We also have a link to where they can find more information and who they can contact if they have questions. 
and they do have to check a little box there that they're saying this information is true and correct. Next slide, please. So how do we monitor all that data that gets put into there? So we receive a comprehensive informer report. That's the software that, that we use to create this report that makes it automatic. It lists all the students' responses along with the pertinent information that we've requested. And the IT department set it up so that Carice and I automatically receive this every Friday morning. And then one of us goes in and quickly reviews the report to investigate any unauthorized locations. Um, we, we basically sort it by state there, and most of them are California, so we can scan to the ones that are not California. And then if there's a student that we'll need to investigate, we copy that specific row from the report into a tracking spreadsheet that lists each student we've had to investigate, so we're keeping track of all the ones we've done in the past um, and the ones that we need to work on right now. We include a notes column where we write out the results of our investigation. And um, a lot of times there are errors. So the first thing we do is look up the courses that they're actually registered for. And sometimes we see that they're all on-ground courses. And so we're, hmm, that's weird, right? So we reach out to the advisor and a lot of times we'll find out that it was an error. The student didn't understand the question. And that actually happens frequently with our international students, I think because of the, the language um, barrier there. And, but anyway, we start by going to the advisor first to see whether the student, in fact, will be located in that unapproved location. We confirm the type of activity that's going to be taking place. And if needed, we reach out to the student as well to ask questions. Um, if we determine that it is indeed an unauthorized location, we brainstorm like what we can do about it before telling them they can't go there. We might try to look into the, you know, into that particular state to see if there's a way we can become authorized or there's certain activity doesn't trigger a need for authorization or approval. Or we might look and see if there's a neighboring state um, that we are approved in and that we can then um, have them do the activity in that state instead or something like that. So we try to see if there's any way we can accommodate the student, but sometimes we do have to inform the student that unfortunately they're not going to be able to take that online course while they're there or continue the program that they're in. Um, just depends on, on the situation. Next slide, please. And so I just wanted to show you a snippet of our tracking spreadsheet so you can see what I was talking about. So this is how we kind of document what we've been doing and how we track this. Uh, you can see there the kinds of information that we have. We know what program they're in. The, um, the MO on the active program indicates to us that it's a fully online program. And so then we know they're an online student versus an on-ground student. Um, we do have the notes column over there on the right where we remind us about important details and how it was resolved or not resolved or what we're looking into. And then we change the color of the, the state or reg residency column there. We'll change that to green once we clear the case so that we know that um, it's, it's fine and we don't have to keep investigating. And I believe that's our last slide. Next slide is our contact information. So again, we are happy to, um, to talk to anyone who has questions or wants more information. We um, are very happy to share this today. I'm very honored to have received the award. So thank you, San. Well, we're very pleased that uh, you could present this to us, that you would be willing to share your processes with us. And so we're, we're very thankful to both the University of Louisville and to um, Mount St. Mary's University for their great work um, in uh, location in terms of the processes they put in place at their institutions. And I also just want to thank Michelle for pointing out that uh, part of their work was because they were um, viewing some of the other things that had been shared from other SAN members, particularly uh, in this case, Northern Arizona University with Sherry Miller, who's been a very um, important colleague for SAN. And so we appreciate her work, um, as well as many others who are willing to share. So that's how our, our network works. So Michelle, thanks for thanks for pointing that out and uh, congratulations to both of your universities for your great work. Well we're going to turn it around now over to our next set of award winners 
And uh, this is the area of compliance innovations. And this is a very interesting thing here because this is the first year that we have offered this, um, this award. We uh, decided to review, we have our um, sensational uh, board group who uh, reviews the applications and also helps um, the directors assess how we should be providing these awards for each year and uh, you know our descriptions of our awards and what awards are, um, are timely. And what we found is that our institutions are becoming very creative in how they are working with their institutions um, you know, throughout the institution to be able to gather information and manage it in a uh, comprehensive institution format. And uh, that's very important. And some of the uh, things that were shared with us from some institutions didn't quite fit into the previous categories that we had. So we thought we wanted to have something a little more broad so that we could share some of the very creative tools that have also been created um, to manage the compliance. And we have uh, two uh, institutions who have won this award this year, the International Sports Sciences Association, who is a brand new member, and Texas Women's University. And uh, our two presenters today, first with ISSA is um, Patrick Gamboa. He serves as the Chief Operating Officer um, for the International Sports Science Association. In addition to his responsibilities with ISSA, he is a Distance Education Accrediting Commission Certified Business Education and TIV Evaluator the DIAC award chair, and a regional lead testing coordinator for the National Board of Fitness Examiners. And uh, our other presenter today is from Texas Women's University is Allison Rogers. And Allison is the communications coordinator for the Office of Teaching and Learning with Technology at Texas Women's University. She has worked there since October of 2004 and in her current position, she sends university-wide communications related to her office and assists with department-related content for other Texas Women University publications. She also coordinates events and assists with the university state authorization efforts. Well, I wanna welcome both of you. Um, we're we're going to start with our presentations with the International Sports Science Association. So I'm going to turn it over to Patrick. Patrick? Let's make sure that you're able to speak. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Good afternoon, Cheryl. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So I just want to, uh, I just want to thank um, all the co-presenters, uh, Catherine, Carice, Michelle, and Allison um, for their presentations and uh, thank uh, San uh, for this award and on behalf of the ISSA. And so in listening to the first presentations, uh, as Cheryl said, we at the ISSA are new to SAN. So I'm seeing the consistency in the presentations, which I did not follow. So I'm gonna go through uh, our presentation and give a little background on ISSA. Uh, ISSA is a strictly online uh, education. Um, we have only 13 programs, all certificate based and one associate's degree, but the bulk of all of our students are all online. We have about 20,000 students who enroll at the ISSA on a yearly basis. We only have one location in Carpentria, California. Um, and we're relatively new, uh, school to the entire accreditation, state licensing, and uh, Title IV processes. So. Uh, as part of the DAC and now part of SAN, a lot of what we've learned uh, come from webinars and information sharing uh, as being done today. And that's how we've grown ourselves um, into uh, who we are at this point. Um, next slide, please. So the, uh, I was unaware that this was an inaugural uh, award, so we want to say thank you again. Um, and I think we're representing the San small schools. We see a lot of big schools like Louisville. Uh, um, and I know there's a lot of smaller schools who don't have the same extensive staff. So from the standpoint of an innovation, I think this is a, a new idea for the ISSA, but a compliance innovation to save audit headaches. You know, with reality out there for all of our, the fellow state authorization compliance officers and those uh, like, uh, Carice and Michelle from the beautiful state of California, albeit a little bit rainy where I am today. You know, the complexities of, of balancing compliance, you know, education, finances, marketing, advertising, um, to say madly, is, uh, can be a juggling act. Um, we're tasked with so much in annual reporting that requires data, a lot of which was shared already just on the uh, locating of the students in our previous two 
uh, presentations, uh, but even more so with uh, uh, default rates, job placement rates, earnings, uh, asset to liability ratios, composite scores. It all seems to be in order. And then all of a sudden, um, uh, next slide please, you get the unannounced visit. Here in California, um, the California Bureau of Private and Post-Secondary Education can come knocking on your door at any time. And they do a lot of unannounced visits. So uh, that day you get that call, you know, Mr. and Mrs. X from the California um, State Authorization is here for an unannounced visit. You know, are you ready? Or worst case scenario, in a small school, you're the only compliance officer. You know, um, who, will, who will be ready to conduct a visit and show compliance for the authorized officer um, from the state authorization? Uh, as a DAC business education and Title IV evaluator, I've gone on uh, close to 18 school visits. And many of these visits are located in California. And we've had the ability to sit in on um, with, with um, representatives from the state. And so we get, uh, I've been able to get a bird's eye view of some of their thought processes from a compliance standpoint behind the doors. You know, what some of the things we've heard behind the doors are, you know, this school doesn't seem to be organized. They don't seem to know where document X is. They don't seem to be able to reproduce what they say they have data for. Um, and so those are some of the things that um, came to mind. So next slide, please. So this got me thinking, you know, uh, would my team at the ISSA um, be able to pass an un unannounced visit in my absence as a compliance officer. And at that time, I had to look in and say the answer was no. You know, so this revealed um, an opportunity to improve. Uh, next slide, please. So for us, um, the first step was that we wanted to look at um, the gaps whether you're at a bigger school like Louisville or at a small school like us at the ISSA with a smaller staff, you know, we needed to see what our gaps were. Our gaps were we needed to identify, we had a lack of interdepartment communication across uh, related compliance issues, whether it was our Title IV office, whether it was our financial office, whether it was within marketing, whether advertising, and crossing over on regulations, you know, we weren't communicating um, as effectively as we could. Um, lack of any type of training to handle an actual visit outside of the individual in the state authorization office. Um, lack of specific compliance, uh, of knowing the specifics to our state and the uh, compliance regulations. And lack of a central location for documentation, whether it's a, a online, whether it's physical, um, to be able to have ready access uh, upon request to the auditors. Uh, next slide. So for us, um, we looking through what we found, we found a simple solution. Um, and, our, and our simple solution uh, was to create uh, a shared Google Drive for all of uh, the heads of the departments and to create a physical folder, um, which we called, uh, next slide, which we called our eyes to say nuclear football. You know, I'm not sure how the name came about, but it must have been, we must have been watching some doomsday thing and, uh, and the nuclear football having all the power within that to initiate was why we came up with that. Um, so uh, the nuclear football uh, has a lot of a uh, the, only the key personnel that I have to say have access to this on the Google on a shared drive and a lot and, and it's locked down with our documentation in our file room. Um, so next slide. So we don't want to go through this too much, but uh, we can discuss it afterwards. But a few of the things that are within that file are as follows. You can see them there. Uh, go ahead. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So 
um, while documentation uh, and ready access to that documentation for the data to support various items that are required, uh, like job placement data, like location data, like cohort default rates, um, all those, all the information that you have to provide, um, then to also be able to provide proof um, in records within the student records um, was an area. But all of that, while important, another aspect of what was missing was uh, the proper communication with depart within departments. So a lot of the bigger schools probably already do this, and we're new. So this um, uh, and this idea that we also got um, from a convention uh, at DAC was uh, to create an institutional research analytics and decision support team. So uh, it was basically to ensure ISSA's effectiveness to understand all that is contained within that nuclear football um, and uh, how to go about um, handling unannounced visits, whether it's an unannounced Department of Education visits, unannounced VA visits, unannounced uh, Department of Defense visits, unannounced um, state authorization visits. Um, that's what, that's the reason it was created. So next slide. Uh, so for us, um, for the smaller schools who might not have it already, you know, uh, I used to say this, uh, our team, you know, number one thing was to, between departments strives to be honest, transparent, and open-minded. Uh, a lot of departments are run sometimes, you know, with the, the, they have their own agendas in mind, whether you're talking about marketing and advertising and you're telling them, you know, you can't say this or you can't do that. Um, sometimes they're not as cooperative. Um, so uh, being open-minded and transparent, you know, accuracy to be hundred percent accurate in all of our reporting and analysis uh, and efficiency to be continually improving efficiency through human expertise and, and t technology and policies and procedures. Uh, next slide. Uh, the areas that uh, are overseen uh, in these, in these regards uh, are academics. Next slide. Uh, so um, I say regular reviews, uh, institutional effectiveness data, key indicators, important to evaluate and extent to which these mission, our mission is achieved. Benchmarks in areas of graduation rates, graduate, uh, graduate employment and achievement of program outcomes provide baseline measures to evaluate progress throughout the year and monitor trends that inform adjustments to implemented processes and procedures. Next slide. And then we have operations. Um, go ahead, next slide. Uh, so, and then we also have, uh, no, you can go ahead. And then we also have uh, uh, our financials. And you can go, next slide. Uh, so ultimately, um, the, the innovation at place that was to avoid the headache of the audits. A lot of times um, with the smaller schools and even with the bigger schools, one person has a lot of the information in their, the funnel point, um, but creating a communication so that uh, everyone across the board in the event uh, that the one point of contact is not there is ready and has the proper training to handle the questions related to um, the visit, has access to the proper documentation for verification throughout the different files, um, is going to be much more beneficial and proactive um, than not being ready for those unannounced visits. Um, so uh, if you have questions, uh, I know we're going to do a question and answer at the end. So um, thank you so much for taking the time to, to listen and allow me to present today. Thanks so much, Patrick. Appreciate you being on. And uh, there is no real uh, direct format that you needed to follow. So you did perfect uh, in terms of providing what your institution is doing. So we're really glad that you could be on the call and share that and welcome to SAN. Um, as one of our new members. Okay, I'm going to turn it straight over to um, to our uh, Texas Women University uh, winner, who is uh, they won for for, for the um, oh gosh, Cheryl getting befuddled. Um, they won for innovations, and we have Allison Rogers to be able to present about their project. So I'm going to turn it straight over to Allison. Well, thank you, Cheryl, and thank you to everyone else who has joined us today. As Cheryl said, I am with Texas Women's University. 
We are a public co-ed four-year institution that awards bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. And our primary campus is located in Denton, which is just, um, it's in the upper right section of North Texas, a little bit north of Dallas and Fort Worth, uh, and just south of Oklahoma. We offer degree programs in the liberal arts, nursing, health sciences, business, and education. And we also have a health sciences center in Dallas and in Houston. We are the largest university primarily for women in the country. And our total enrollment for this past fall was 15,520. And I'm in the Office of Teaching and Learning with Technology. Our role is to help faculty um, incorporate technology into their teaching. We also provide administrative support for online programs and we um, oversee state authorization. Next slide, please. So here are some pictures of students on campus, but I want to tell you about our distance education offerings and our distance learners. We currently offer 43 programs through distance education. Um, in Texas, a distance education program is one in which more than half of it is delivered electronically. And of those 43 um, programs, we offer 13 undergraduate completion programs. We call them completion because only the junior and senior level courses are predominantly or fully online. We also offer 30 graduate level distance education programs and roughly half of which can be earned fully electronically. And I say electronically rather than online because we do have a few uh, DE graduate programs that utilize a mix of online courses and televideo. And we also have six online certificates. And while not distance education programs, Texas Women's also has over 50 professional programs um, or ones that prepare for a licensed profession. And looking at the demographic data for our fall 2018 students who were only taking courses classified as DE, they accounted for almost a third of our entire student enrollment. The majority of them were female. They were enrolled in a graduate program, 22 to 40 years old, and were living in the Metroplex region, which is the area around Denton, Dallas, and Fort Worth. Or they were in the, uh, the second largest group, lived in the Gulf Coast region, which is near our Houston campus. And um, of our students taking only DE courses, 196 listed an out-of-state address as their local address. So I go into that information just to give you a sense of the scope of our work related to state authorization here at Texas Women's. Uh, while not a huge amount, we do have students living in other states taking online courses with us. And of course we have students who want to do field placements in other states. So that impacts just general state authorization compliance. And then with having so many professional programs, that means that we have to pay attention to the rules associated with disclosures and communicating with licensure boards. We are a member of CERA, which helps tremendously with the general state authorization compliance. However, as most of you might be experiencing, things get a little bit more difficult when dealing with compliance related to professional programs. And that is where our compliance innovation came in handy. Next slide, please. So for the past three summers, our Office of General Counsel has hosted a compliance workshop where every person on campus that oversees a compliance area is invited to come hear updates related to compliance at TWU and learn ways to better manage our own compliance area. Well, in 2017, the theme of the workshop was proactive compliance. And our compliance director, Dina King, gave this great presentation about just being aware of what is required in your compliance area and where you stand within that. The main point that she focused on was doing a self audit, looking at the big picture of what you need to do to be in compliance and why, and then analyze where your weaknesses are in your compliance plan so that you can fix it, which in turn helps you to be more in compliance. I distinctly remember arriving at the workshop very nervous and frustrated because I knew we were going to be required to do some sort of activity centered around our area of compliance. And I was there, of course, for state authorization. The Department of Ed, um, their regulations for state authorization of distance education had just been released the previous fall and they were scheduled to go into effect in one year and I did not know what to do with them. I didn't even know where to start in terms of interpreting what they meant and how it would apply to our institution and I really dreaded trying to explain something I didn't understand to others. Next slide please. 
And as we know, state authorization, as mentioned in the previous presentation, uh, it's a juggling act. There are many balls in motion that we have to juggle well in order to be in compliance. There are the state laws governing higher education in each state. There is the Department of Defense, MOU. There are program integrity rules, of course, SARA. And then again, the federal regulations, which are now delayed, but at the time of this workshop, they were not. So I was feeling a bit overwhelmed, and then Dina announced the hands-on activity for the workshop would be a self-audit worksheet. She provided us with an electronic copy and gave us time to fill it out, and it did not take me long to see that it was exactly what I needed. It forced me to get organized and basically make a map of what was required for each of those oversight groups or regulations and where Texas Women's stood within each requirement. Next slide, please. So here's what the worksheet looks like. Uh, the first thing was to list the law, regulation, or agreement, in the case of Sarah, um, that we needed to comply with. I did a separate chart or worksheet for each of those five groups that I mentioned earlier. And then in the far left column, I listed what was required to be in compliance with that particular group or regulation. Um, so for example, Sarah, one compliance step is to annually report the number of students taking DE courses from another state with your institution. So that was one step that I listed for, for Sarah. Well, then the chart asks you to list if you are in compliance with that step. Yes, no, partially, or not applicable. In the next column, we give more details about our answer. If we said yes or partial, how can we prove that? If no or partial, what actions do we need to take to get that to a yes? And then moving to the other columns, we list who is responsible for that compliance step, when it's due, and any notes that will help. So back to Sarah, for Sarah reporting, my office is responsible for submitting that, and it's usually due, if I remember correctly, in the late spring, early summer. And then in the notes column, I referenced where in the SARA manual the data reporting is explained. So again, I made a new chart for each of those five groups and I took it a step further um, by color coding the rows across the worksheets where there were similar compliance requirements. So for example, disclosures related to licensure um, programs. All five of those groups that I mentioned before have a disclosure requirement. So color coding that across every worksheet helped me to see that number one, that was a priority. And number two, if I reached compliance in that area with one law regulation or group, I was in compliance or at least close to it with that same step in another group. And another benefit um, of not only compliance of having this worksheet um, has been that it's helped me to be able to explain um, to others and mainly to our administration in a very simple and easy to read way what state authorization even is and everything that goes with it. Uh, we had a little bit of trouble getting our disclosures off the ground, which is another story for another day, but having this worksheet and passing out copies um, electronically and in hard copy to those who had some influence over that helped tremendously in being able to move that project along. And so, in short, this worksheet was our compliance innovation that our Director of Compliance created. It's very simple, but it has really helped me get my head wrapped around what needs to be done, uh, where we have work to do, and where we are in good standing. And I apologize, I forgot to include my contact information in, in my slides, um, but if you have questions or comments or just need more information, you can reach me at A-R-O-G-E-R-S, and then the number eight, A Rogers 8 at TWU.edu or 940-898-3411. Uh, from Texas Women's University, thank you all again for listening and I hope you have a great day. Thanks very much, Allison. And, and not to worry, you'll find that the uh, email addresses for all of our presenters are also listed uh, in another place in the uh, slide list. Um, and so actually I'll show you right here that if you uh, go to the website later this week, you can find that all of the email addresses for our presenters are listed here today. I'm very grateful to Catherine, to Kyrice, Michelle, Patrick, and Allison for their great work and for their willingness to present here today. We have run out of time in terms of questions, but I do hope that if, I see no questions actually in the question box, but you all may be thinking about what kind of questions you have um, and then want to email them to me, that would be just fine. So feel free to email me with any questions you may have, and I am happy to coordinate with our presenters today. Um, to try to get answers to your questions, or um, as they've offered uh, their contact information, you may contact them directly. 
Um, you'll see here that there are uh, locations where you can find out more information about WCET and SAN. And also uh, the upcoming uh, WCET SAM Basics Workshop. There are still openings available. It's March 6 and 7 in Arlington, Virginia. It's right across the river from Washington, DC. Um, the uh, Reagan National Airport is the uh, easiest uh, airport to access this area. And uh, we'll be staying at the Key Bridge Marriott. Uh, I think this will be a very good workshop and we're very pleased to be able to bring it to the East Coast for our East Coast members. Um, you, as I mentioned, our resources are available under past webinars. You'll find that on the SAN website. And we want to thank our supporting members, Colorado State University, Michigan State University, and University of Missouri, Columbia, Mizzou Online. They are um, WCT uh, supporting members, and we appreciate their work with WCET, as well as WCET's annual sponsors that you see listed here. Thank you all very much for being on the call today, and thank you so much to our presenters for your time and your very good work. Congratulations, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. We'll be talking with you all soon. Have a great day.